ông quay cho ông đường nhiều đẹp và cả một to cái trong đại ca này thì thị xã ma ca hay nông đào bê tê ca chun từ cùng bây giờ bị cặp cái đây luôn luôn chia đã bị bẩn to hoặc cả ắt thật thì bài thì có vừa cả có thông quan lượng bẩn đại cái xã còn lư đã 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 đòi phi kỳ ta phải nhá nâng bê tê vì nó mốc năm nay đang đang rập vào bên này anh xong chơi Mitvi, copy some awkward look at him. I've been told that I'm going much too fast for the translators to keep up. So I said, "Do you have to slow down?" And I'm not sure if I'm going too fast. 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 Mr. President, you honest before the break, I concluded my one-by-one discussion of the prosecution's documents in relation to the JCPOA policy and amendments. But to complete our response, these documents, of course, must be placed in a greater context. Statements so-called enemies made by or on behalf of the CPK. The idea that the CPK had a policy of killing enemies it's something like saying that every state which has an army has a policy of war. Mr. President, you honestly before the break said that every state which has an army has a policy of war. Mr. President, you honestly before the break said that every state which has an army has a policy of war. Mr. President, you honestly before the break said that every state which has an army has a policy of war. Mr. President, you honestly before the break said that every state which has an army has a policy of war. Mr. President, you honestly before the break said that every state which has an army has a policy of war. Mr. President, you honestly before the break said that every state which has an army has a policy of war. Mr. President, you honestly before the break said that every state which has an army has a policy of war. Mr. President, you honestly before the break said that every state which has an army has a policy of war. Mr. President, you honestly before the break said that every state which has an Examples. In a speech broadcast proudly to the world in September 2011, President George Bush of the United States described his determination to fight the enemies of the United States. We will find those who did it. We will smoke them out. 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 Thank you, Mr. President. The council has already been told to limit himself to the documents of this case. And now he is attempting to present evidence about speeches by others. This is not evidence, but this is part of this trial. I don't want to interfere in this presentation, but I think he is well exceeding the proper scope of permissible basis of responding to the documents that have been submitted by the prosecutors. Mr. President, I would like to ask you to stand up. Mr. President, if I may, I am not presenting evidence. I am trying to picture a general, a more general context, quoting four lines of the speech that everybody in this courtroom in the world knows about. It's not evidence of general knowledge. I'll be doing, I'll be giving some other quotes to a three more. Just to picture the broader context. It's not presenting any of it. 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 Thank you, Mr. President.
ันดุนชี้ก็คือมีลักษณะสมตรอภัยโดยเฉพาะให้ตรงเมตวีจุมโตเตลือบรรดาไอกษาคนลึกได้ดับบังไฮดาวเพียกีมาคางติดมันก็ใบเตลือกไว้ในกลาวิชาลเพียบในกรอบขั้นไอกษาคนลึกได้เพียกีมาคางติดบานดับบังไฮกลมอนนุตีเมตตาเบย์เขียนลงทุนเขียนลงชื่อเยี่ยมแล้วเขียนมีนสกัดได้ดอกสองอ่อนอ่อนเช่นนี้เขียนมันดอกสองที่คนแต่การพูดของเราเขียนคนแต่ชาวมาเจ้าอ่อยบางทางไปปาร์บัตตุลิตุลุมตุลิกุลยาบายแต่เมตตานมปะกมิกรรมเชี่ยแต่ยูนิเซตส่งตุลุมังคือทาวิสตีนตุนังไว้ได้สารอมริบานฟื้นไม่ไม่ได้โดยเชี่ยนตุนังสุนทรีมลุลุติปีได้แต่ตรงตุนังกาปนปองตุลุชุชุนชิปนรบสารอมริจิดามนุ It's a pity. But we will move on. To the actual dialogue with the official officials. The president of the Republic of Vietnam. And that is the alleged CPK policy. To execute for new soldiers and officials along the long regime. As the chairman knows. โดยได้อ่อนชุมเบบานเชียบเฮยยังบานชุมตัวอัมพีกูนยุบายได้บานอาหารนี่เอาไว้ได้ยังบานสุดับการติดชั้นได้และสัพเพียญบานพอดอลชิพอตต่างอุ้ยยังการติดคืนชิบะยังมันคืนทาเมียนพอตต่างเอาไว้ just like new day เฮย that there was no policy เฮยมันเมียนกูนยุบายนู่นได้ Now we will spend quite a bit of time on this topic. So allow me to give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short roadmap of how my presentation will progress. Let me give you a short This is, as you will, a general summary of the kinds of weaknesses we are seeing in these documents. Second, we will go through the documents that the prosecution presented. We will do this fairly thoroughly and try to show the chain how these general weaknesses apply. And thirdly, we will talk a little bit about our own analysis of the witness statements quoted earlier by the prosecution. We will show that these statements are chronically unreliable. That they say nothing of substance, and indeed, in many ways, they affirmatively disprove. The co-prosecutors claim that the CPK is set up to target the official of the Republic. Sometimes the most Important thing about the evidence in the case is what it does not include. What does the evidence not include in this case? The first thing it does not include, and I have heard it in the presentation, is a single piece of physical evidence that a single soldier was executed anywhere in Cambodia. There are no exhumed graves and no dead bodies. There is no forensic analysis. Now this is not standard practice in a murder investigation. It is not standard practice in international courts. In Yugoslavia, investigators went out into the fields. They dug up graves. They found bodies all together in one place. And they were able to determine when those people were killed and how. Now that is proven. The other thing the documentary evidence doesn't include is a single witness to a single execution of a single soldier. 
Now we are going to talk about, about this in much greater detail, greater detail later when we go through the evidence, uh, the documentary evidence, and talk about those uh, witness statements. But for now, Mr. President, let me give, this, uh, let me give the chamber this one takeaway conclusion. Not a single one of those witnesses witnessed a single killing. Now, even in an ordinary domestic murder investigation, the fact that there was no body, no body, no evidence of the time or place, or no eyewitness accounts would make a conviction nearly impossible. Our client is being accused of mass murder. Charges are serious. And the documentary um, evidence should logically uh, be more plentiful and not less. And the standards that we apply in this courtroom should be at least as high. Now, we are going to talk about the evidence that we have to talk about. As defense lawyers, we have only one anxiety about the evidence that has been presented about the supposed policy to execute your no soldiers and officials. And it's not that the evidence is strong. It's that the documentary evidence is so weak, so weak that we have a custom to have been become accustomed to this in this courtroom. We fear that the using which expression the prosecution is moving the goalposts. In other words, they are changing the standards by which these kinds of charges are usually judged. And we would urge the chamber to guard against that. Uh, we urge this chamber to ensure uh, that the documentary evidence is held to the high standard which the law requires. Now, I don't mean to say uh, that a murder case cannot be circumstantial. It can be, if the evidence, of course, is strong enough. But the fact that there is literally no direct evidence of any kind is meaningful. It should make this chamber insist that the circumstantial evidence on offer is especially compelling. With that in mind, I would like to call your attention, Mr. President, to a systematic flaw in that documentary evidence. It symbols the witness statements and documents itself. And the flaw is that almost none of those documents presented by prosecution say anything about killing. They talk about the alleged victims being separated, taken away, arrested, Sent to Ankar. But without any evidence that any of those people were killed, and there is none, those documents show nothing of relevance to this trial. The chamber, this chamber is being urged to conclude that because people were targeted, they must necessarily have been killed. But that inference is far too aggressive. But it is not supported by the evidence. And on appeal, the aggression of the inference obviously will not stand. There are numerous ways in which we can show the chamber the danger of inferring merely from evidence of targeting. Uh, now, if you allow me, let us look at three brief examples. One example is from a witness who testified recently before the chamber. His name was He testified on June 20. During the co-prosecutor's examination, Mumuk described an instance. Uh, I'm sorry to have to get on my feet again, Your Honours, um, but this is a point that I raised at the start, and Council is, I believe, veering far from the purpose of this proceedings. We are going to have final arguments. Council is entitled in final arguments to, to, to address issues about burden of proof, to talk about the witness testimony. Um, this is not the time. 
to be making final closing arguments. And counsel is now attempting to read from part of the testimony of a witness and make overall comments about the burden of proof, uh, which we strenuously disagree with, but more to the point, is not part of the purpose of the current proceedings. So we would object uh, to the use to counsel at this point, reading testimony, trial testimony, and uh, making comments about that. Mr. President, my intention is to paraphrase one to uh, uh, from this uh, trial transcript. I'm not making any closing arguments. I'm just uh, trying to establish the probative value of documents in relation to uh, uh, what I one, one specific witness, because I only use one witness, has actually testified. So it's all about the context in, in respect to the probative value. I'm not making an argument or closing argument about the, the, the value of movement. I'm just using him as a frame of reference to respect to the probative value of all of these particular topics. That's what I'm looking for. ສະຫນັງຕໍ່ຂອງອຳນາດທາດປະຍາອັນປີວິທີສາດໃນການບັນຫານອະທິບາຍຫຼືກັບກອດຕົງກໍຂອງ <laughs> ສັກກິກຳຂອງສະໃສເມື່ອກໍຊ່ວຍບັນຈັງຫຼືກໍບໍ່ບັນຫານໃນຈະພູມຸກອົງຈຳແລະໃນປີນີ້ທີ່ປ
The children of soldiers, sub-district chiefs and police were purged and sent to do production in one place. Now what we are interested in is the word purged. Many documents, as you know, use the word purged. Typically, the prosecution asks the chamber to interpret that word to mean but obviously, in this particular document, it doesn't. Obviously, it just means separate because you can't be killed and then sent to do production. A third example, or now a second example, is from Philip Short's book, Document P3-8-9. Um, I'll quote from English, uh, ERN 0038 uh, There is no Khmer translation, my apologies that we don't have the French right now. According to Short, during the evacuation of Phnom Penh factory workers, the factory was separated from the general population. Short comments. When nothing further was heard from them, the many deportees the Another example, Mr. President, uh, is that one that we have already seen. And even the word smash doesn't always mean kill. And we showed that further up in our discussion of document P3-5. The, limita the limitations in, the in this evidence are such that even if no contrary evidence existed, the chamber would be incapable of making the remarkable conclusion that a countrywide policy to execute uh, all Khmer Republic soldiers and officials Existed. But contrary evidence does exist. Prosecution's evidence is not just insufficient on its face. There are countless statements which show clearly that the party center explicitly instructed their troops and cadres not to execute soldiers. We are going to read uh, some of those statements for you later in this morning, probably this afternoon. There are statements from people who were directly with Nunchia, Popot, and others within the core of the party center. And these are people who were relied on repeatedly by the investigating judges in the closing order. They were relied on by the experts summoned by this chamber as key insider witnesses. And they say no. Nunchia and Popov did not order the execution of the soldiers of the last regime. And there are other statements from soldiers in the field who state that their instructions were not to kill soldiers captured in the battle. Unlike the prosecution's systematically flawed documentary evidence, all of these statements contain first-hand evidence. All of them are from witnesses who were in the position to know the facts they are telling us. These were some general observations. Uh, Mr. President, we now begin to discuss the specific documents presented by the co-prosecutors. And let me begin the discussion, the discussion by quoting some of the first uh, words of that presentation. Uh, the co-prosecutors said the following. My, uh, this is at page 98 of the draft transcript for June 26. They said, and I quote, let me now turn to the documents that answer a question that Nunchia's counsel has asked a number of times, which is where are the documents that show the policy targeting normal officials and soldiers. And the now, Mr. President, you honestly have to admit that when I heard that, I got excited. I remember I was sitting here in this chair, and I think I even stepped forward a little bit. And I suppose I was excited for a couple of reasons. One is just uh, that it was good to find out that the prosecution had been listening to the new chief defense team. We weren't sure of that before. 
But then, they chose to spend a substantial part of their presentation of the documents yeah, about this alleged policy of targeting uh, the and I realized, Mr. President, that we are actually on the same page. We're both concerned about whether any actual evidence of this policy exists. And the second reason I was excited is that I felt like we were about to hear something really interesting. Here was the prosecution telling us at long last, here are the documents that you have been waiting for. And it will not be a surprise, Mr. President, that uh, if I admit that I was a bit, there was a bit of a letdown, because then the co-prosecutors actually presented the documents. And as they came up on the screen, those documents failed completely and totally to give this court even a glimmer of evidence that anybody in the party center ever formulated the policy of any kind. Uh, ពាក់ព័ត៌មិនគល់យោបាយអនុក្រមការសម្រេចគ្មារ to show that, Mr. President, that I will not go through those documents in some detail. And I will follow the order of the prosecution's presentation. First, the prosecution presented two documents intended to show the ideological foundation of the supposed policy to execute law and officials. The first document was a 1972 it is apparent that these documents are manifestly inadequate to establish the existence of a concrete policy to execute specific people. However, only the most general prescriptions about class divisions. The chamber should take heed of the prosecution's use of these documents as an indication of how we, the overall body of documentary evidence, uh, must truly be. But even if we did accept this evidence on the prosecution's own terms, we would find that they have seriously misrepresented to the chamber what it says. They have selectively quoted from it to badly distort its meaning. We can only assume that the prosecution understands well how disproportionate the resources are on each side of this aisle and are hoping that the defense teams have no time to verify these documents. The prosecution uses the first document E3146 for definitions of two types of classes, a feudalist aristocratic class and the intellectual second capitalist class. As the co-prosecutors rightly say, that they are in English 0053-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6-7-3-6
The co-prosecutors then begin the next page. That's not surprising since it says the following. I quote. Our attitude towards these groups is that we have to persuade them to join the front and then to elim eliminate their political stance and their old ideology by educating them continuously. But it is important that we read this new plan to them and have them do labor work to produce food to support themselves. Further down in that same page, the document describes a different kind of feudalist class, which it calls the feudalist landowner class. And these include, and I quote, persons who own land and have their power to control land. And then just one paragraph further down, it says, again, we should not, we should not attack them constantly. We must know how to persuade them to join in the front rank. But we always have to be cautious with them. We should struggle with them to diminish their influence by reducing the rice paddy to as little as what the other persons have. And of course, having skipped these persons the co-prosecutors then misrepresented the document even more ingeniously by citing the definition of the intellectual second capitalist class, the intellectual second capitalist in English, DRM 0053, the, 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 the corpus of the writing said that this, inclu this class includes, quote, students and civil servants who mainly use their intelligence for living, But then they leave out the paragraph immediately before, and the sentence immediately after. Full of quote reads as follows. The second capitalist class. To speak conclusively, this is called the mediocre middle class. They do not oppress anyone, but they are not oppressed by anyone either. Their economic interest is mediocre, and so is their political interest. They live peacefully. Then it continues, there are two types of second capitalists. One, uh, intellectual second capitalist, these include civil students and civil servants who mainly use the intelligence for living. Their important point is that they are patriotic. They love revolution. They want to do the revolution because they, to some extent, are oppressed by the enemy. Another strong point is that they can understand and see the idea and theory quickly. But their weak points are they are afraid of hardship. They want to stay peacefully alone. And they absorb the revolutionary line slowly. This is because they rarely receive any hardship and were not badly oppressed by the enemy. And of course, the prosecution's treatment of the second document, E310, Mr. President, was less dishonest. Not surprisingly, uh, it is also, uh, it also proves nothing pernicious. Indeed, it explicitly recognizes that capitalists and feudalists can be forced. It also explains that government officials, policemen, Soldiers and students were not themselves the instigators, but that when the capitalists and feudalists held power, they paid, I quote, they paid government agents to show their faces. End of quote. And the implication is, now that they do not hold power, they, and not their agents, are the targets.
Next, the prosecution presented from an interview given by Insuri at the airport in 1978. The document number is E-707-P. In the excerpt quoted by the prosecution, in Suri, I quote, Describe the different forces within the Kampuchea ruling class at that time, indicating three broad groupings. On the far right, there were those like Lo Nol, who were completely reactionary and nothing but lackeys of foreign imperialism. In the center stood Sihanouk, the head of state, and some others like him, who, while oppressing communism, also supported the policy of genuine political independence for the country. And on the left were progressive people like Hugh Sampon, today's president of the State Presidium, who at that time was a well-known intellectual and politician. And of quote, your Honours, I would probably spend the whole day just talking about how little this one quote has to do with any allegation in this trial. Firstly, it is apparent that Ng Seri is speaking here of the very highest ranking members of the Cambodian political class. He himself, he himself calls them the ruling class. Now, it says nothing about military officers, let alone soldiers. Second, it is once again a, a vague political analysis. It doesn't so much as hint that anybody, even Lonald himself, ought to be executed. Third, it is almost as if the prosecution forgets that Ng Suri is describing a moment in time during which he was one of the leaders, leaders of the rebel movement fighting, fighting a civil war against the Lonol. Does the prosecution expect Ng Suri to complement leadership and the circumstances in the ground which could be only described as mild. And fourth, and maybe most important, is there anyone in this courtroom that is seriously doubt his analysis of Insuri? Of course, Lord Noel was a client of the United States. Most of the evidence before this court shows that the wealthy merchant class in Phnom Penh, whom the prosecution would seek to place first on the list of enemies of the CPK, also hated Long Nol. Ng Sarees' opposition to Long Nol shows exactly nothing about the CPK attitude to any segment of the population. There is only one Interesting thing about this quote, which is that according to Insuri, Sihanouk is not a right-wing reactionary, but a middle ground supporter of Cambodia's political independence. And by 1975, Sihanouk represented an infinitely larger segment of the population than Lonol. Lonol doesn't represent any segment of the population at The prosecution quoted from one more section of this document, which I will reiterate as well from the chain. I quote, We mobilized both the middle and left sections of the ruling class, said and built a united front with them against foreign domination. We isolated the real traitors like the Mono, um, now, our last uh, comments apply equally to this excerpt. It is hardly surprising or interesting 
How many people in Cambodia in April 1975 did not see Lon How many people did not believe that Lon Nol had forsaken Cambodia to the Americans? Did every person who thought Lon Nol was a traitor want to execute ordinary soldiers? ជាជនទីដត់ហើយមិស្ត្រប្រេសីដែលគេត្រូវសម្លាប់ព្រះយ៉ាងម្នាក់ម្នាក់របស់គាត់ទេឯកសារនេះគឺមិនសំស្របទ
ជាមួយនឹងគឺបានប្រឈមគ្រឿងនៅការចាប់អារម្មណ៍ <coughs> Describing the long old government leadership committee on April 30, this supreme committee does not represent anyone but the few traitors. The creation of this organization is an anti-national, anti-popular act designed to continue the treachery, the treachery of the last bunch of traitors. For this reason, Chunkwan says, all brother countrymen in Phnom Penh and a few provincial capitals still under temporary enemy control should unite their strength and overturn this treacherous organization. We believe that Kyusampon's message is very clear. All Cambodians should act together against tiny leaders at the very highest level of the government. Most striking in this quote is Kyusampon's reference to, and I quote, all brother countrymen in Phnom Penh which definitely refutes the prosecution's claim that city dwellers were treated as enemies in April 1975. Those brother countrymen included any officials of the foreign regime outside of the Supreme Committee. Let's present the next group of documents in this general theme. They too all concern this very small group of individuals at the very top of the Lono regime in Phnom Penh. Document numbers are E3-2694, E3-2704, 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 the ranking of the in the French embassy. Uh, and the final two documents are articles uh, uh, from the Washington Post and the Bangkok Post, respectively. All five documents combined report to describe only three executions. Two of the seven uh, super traders and uh, Jean Dirac's telegram says that 100 people were expected to surrender as prisoners to the Khmer Rouge the following day There's no evidence of who those people were. And there's no evidence from this document of what happened to those people. The next document, as President we readily admit, is arguably the best piece of evidence the prosecution came up with. It is an execution order from Kobun and it is document number E3 slash 
it is at least normally relevant, which by itself sets us apart from the rest of the documents presented by the prosecution. And if it were the 15th or 20th piece of evidence, it might even be compelling. But all these documents show is that an order was delivered by Comrade Pin to somebody to execute 17 specific people. It does not show where the order came from or to whom it was delivered. The fact that the order ostensibly came from quote, the party proves, of course, nothing. The chamber has heard testimony that cadres at all levels used the label Ankar opportunistically to exercise their own petty authority. Pins use of the phrase quote, the party does not mean anything literal, including that he was implementing an order from a superior. The document also clearly shows that whoever did decide to execute these 17 people, if indeed someone did, it was not because of their military position. Because the document specifically states the alleged victims were, and I quote, examined, before a decision to execute them was made. Now, if a policy to execute all soldiers or all officers existed, it would be no need to examine any of them. And the document does not mention the following people. Uh, next on the document, to certain names, there are additional indications uh, that each person's loyalty was assessed. Next to number 14, the document states the following, uh, and I quote, He is a former teacher who was a traitor when he was a teacher. In his biography, he criticizes as very strongly using psychological warfare. His responses show absolute support for the Republic regime and opposition to the revolution. I'm referring Mr. President to ER and English 000 and there the order also lists two other senior military officers and a substitute noting, I quote, please keep for examination the following main persons. End of quote. And that along proves that even senior military officers were not executed as a matter of policy. Next, the prosecution presented a news report from Anjan Press that 54 generals were killed shortly after April 1955. In general, Mr. President, the prosecution's continued reliance on news sources should again be indicated to the chamber of the Overall of its documentary evidence. But this document is especially unreliable and has no probable value whatsoever and should be disregarded completely. Neither the journalist nor the unnamed quote unquote resistance spokesman who acts as the sole source is known. Even the description of the source as a uh, resistance spokesman is confusing. Resistance, resistance faction against Pol Pot? If so, isn't the claim transparent and what the Khmer Rouge propaganda is the first? Mr. President, you honestly, is it more unreliable because of the substance uh, it makes absolutely no sense? It claims that the list 
of generals was, and I quote, sent to several Western governments, unquote. Why would the CPK had a vehicle and then announce to the world, to the world that they had done it? And if they did, want to announce it to the world, why would they quietly send a message to Western government and not bluster about it in the revolutionary flag as they did with the seven supercharges? If it was disclosed to several governments, why isn't there any evidence from any other source aside from this single news report from a single journalist? Why did the CPK suddenly decide to review the executions 30 months after they happened? Why did they draw up a list in December 1975, seven months after it happened? And how did they contact Western governments without any direct diplomatic relations? None of this, Mr. President, you makes any sense. <coughs> Next, the co-prosecutors discussed two biographies prepared uh, by cadres of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Those document numbers are E3-359, E3-529, 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 it is apparent that these documents mean absolutely nothing. So I will spend no time on them. I will only say now today that they make no mention of any execution or even ill-treatment of anyone. Next, Mr. President, the co-prosecutor supplied three different S21 prisoner list. Now, before we look at these specific documents, allow me to make an obvious point. Uh, many different kinds of people are allowed to have gone to S21. According to the closing order, the total number of law and order soldiers allegedly killed at now, if our math is correct, that makes 2.5% of the total of prisoners. Was the Lone Wolf Army more or less than 2.5% of the population? Prosecution does not say. So we just know these people were apparently well-known souls. But from this document, there is no evidence that any of them were sent to S21 because because they were lone old soldiers. No, uh, there is no evidence that any one person went to S21 because they were lone old soldiers. Let us now look at the specific documents the co-prosecutors presented. If we look at these documents carefully, we will see the first document proves the opposite of what the co-prosecutors say it proves. It shows that no policy of executing Donald Fisher's existence. And the other two documents prove nothing at all. There's no positive value whatsoever. The first document, Mr. President, is number E3-1539. Now it claims that in one month, 
In my March ແລະຫຼັງຈາກນັ້ນຕ້ອງຕ້ອງຕ້ອງຕ້ອງຕ້ອງຕ້ອງຕ້ອງຕ້ອງຕ້ອງຕ້ອງຕ້ອງຕ
The next two sets of documents presented by the Prosecution Mr. President, as we indicated uh, earlier this morning, we plan to present our own discussion of the witness statements. And the three statements of uh, the, the, the co-prosecutors co presented are part of the discussion. And the Trump Cook records also relate to those if it pleases the Chamber, I will put those uh, the documents aside for now and move on to the co-prosecutor's last few documents. And I will say that we will be at the appropriate moment to have the last breath. ម៉ោងមួយសាមសិបនាទីរសៀលនេះសូមបញ្ជើញជួលវិញដើម្បីបន្តពេញចំណាយការសម្ណាក់ការកបឲ្យអនុរក្ស